are born into the world, we're exposed to all kinds of things. And the onslaught is overwhelming. Think of what a baby does when it's first born. It cries. The air on its skin, all the light, the sounds, the, all this input that it can't make any sense out of. Just stuck with pure sensation, raw sensation. And it hurts. Birth is painful. Birth is stressful. And that's not the end of it. Even as we begin to make sense of our surroundings, the constant onslaught, just beginning with our senses. An image the Buddha gives you, too. One is that it's like someone who's being struck by spears all the time. Another, he says, like it's a cow's skin has been taken off and it's come at its flesh from all directions. There's this constant stream of contacts coming in by way of our senses. And we've got to handle it all, process it all. And so we learn ways of blocking out a lot of this stuff that's coming in. But still, there's a lot that you just simply can't block out. And on top of that, as you gain more sense of your surroundings, you meet up with people things you like, people you like, people you don't like. And there's the push and pull of trying to be around people and things you like and trying to get away from the ones you don't like. The body itself has illness and has ages and finally dies. We get separated from the people we like. All of this is normal, as the chant we chanted just now says. And so why is it that we have to keep being reminded about it? Because the mind creates its walls against these things, in hoping that the walls will keep them out. And yet they can. It's like the walls you build up against the sea. Eventually the sea wears them down. Sometimes it wears them down slowly. Sometimes one single storm can wipe them out. And so we have to find some other way of dealing with this constant onslaught and yet not suffering from it. There are states of meditation you can get into where you just totally block out all sensory input. You have no sense of the body, no sense of anything happening. And even that doesn't last forever. You have to come out of it. The trick is how to deal with these things in a skillful way. In other words, you know sights, you know sounds, you know smells, tastes, tactile sensations. You know ideas coming in into the mind, being created by the mind. And the question is how to interact with them in a way that doesn't create suffering. This is where the Buddha's analysis of suffering is so important. He says it comes from our craving. The suffering itself is the clinging. The fact that we've this constant onslaught, we feel we have to feed on it in order to gain nourishment for the mind. But it's a very tricky food source. The good things don't necessarily last. The bad things come in when we don't want them. And he says a better way, instead of just being very selective about what we eat and hoping that we just keep out the bad stuff and hold on to the good stuff. He says, the better way is to get the mind so strong it doesn't need to feed. In other words, sounds can come and they just go right past. Sights come and they go right past. Aging, illness, and death come and they just go right past. The mind hasn't put itself in a position where it has to feed on them, so it's not, it's not affected by them. Separation comes and it goes right past. It's interesting what the Buddha said that when it, was, it wasn't the Buddha, it was a passage where Sariputta and Ananda are talking. And Sariputta makes a comment that there's nothing in the world whose change would cause him any grief. And Ananda says, well, what about the Buddha? What if something happened to the Buddha? 
And sorry, Buddha said, well, I would regret the passing of such a wonderful person. Realize it was a lot of people would miss out on the opportunity to be with him, but the mind wouldn't grieve. And Ananda makes an interesting point. And he says it's because you're, you've uprooted conceit for such a long time. Because so much of our grief has to do with the I that we create. The thing goes out and has to feed on things, feed on relationships, feed on this, that, and the other thing. So the purpose of the meditation is to learn how to take apart the processes by which we make ourselves suffer. You can't change the fact that the world is, is changing. But you can change the way you relate to the change. You can change the way you participate in the change. So even though change goes on, the mind is a position of strength. And this is not a selfish goal. It's not that you're just sort of pulling out while everybody else is having to suffer. We tend to think of samsara as a place. And the people who are getting out of samsara, it sounds like that they're pulling out when everybody else is still suffering, but that's not the case. Samsara is a process. It's something the mind does. Each person does it. Keeps wandering on, looking for more things to feed on, more things to feed on. And so the best you can do is to learn how to stop, stop the process in your own mind. Because that way you're not fighting other people for the things you need to feed on. Also, you're giving them an example of how true happiness is found. And thirdly, you're operating from a position of strength. When other people are suffering and your mind is strong, you can help them. You're in a much better position to help them. Because if they're down in the in the quicksand, and you're down in the quicksand too. Okay, there's, there's no way you can help each other out. You just sort of pull each other down. But if one person is in the quicksand, the other person is standing on solid ground. The person on sand, standing on solid ground can pull the other person out. So you owe it not only to, to yourself, but also the people around you to put the mind in this strong position, where it's not feeding on things, where it doesn't need things outside for its happiness. It has its own inner resources. And that's what we're doing as we meditate. We're developing these resources in the mind, putting the mind in a position of strength. At first, giving rise to food within the mind so that it doesn't have to feed on things outside. The sense of ease, the sense of calm, the sense of fullness that come with the meditation. Okay, that becomes food for the mind. And as the mind has that sense of inner fullness, It's not out looking for scraps and other things to eat all the time. It's not even out looking for good things from the outside, because it realizes no matter how good things are outside, it's no match at all for the food we create within the mind. And so we don't place such heavy demands on other people. We don't place such heavy demands on the situation around us. Other people find it a lot easier to live with us when the mind has that inner strength. And we find it a lot easier to live with ourselves. And ultimately, as the mind grows stronger, it gets to the point where it doesn't need to feed anywhere, not even inside. Its strengths are perfected, strength of conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. These things, when they're fully developed, put the mind in a position where it doesn't have to feed. When it doesn't have to feed, it doesn't keep wandering on. And, and then as it doesn't keep wandering on, it doesn't keep on creating the, in the situations that would cause more suffering. This is where the Buddhist teachings get really radical when they talk about how it's not just that we're pulling out of a process and it's going to go on. We create the process. We create that outside all those situations through our past and present karma. And when you stop creating them, okay, there's nothing left. Things kind of run out after a while for the enlightened, fully enlightened person. But in the meantime, we have to be very careful. Where is your mind feeding right now? 
Where is it pinning its hopes for happiness? Okay, if it's anything outside, you're in trouble. There's that constant onslaught. You're open to all kinds of stuff. When you have inner source of food, okay, even though you know things that come in via the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, they don't reach in. They don't make inroads on the mind the way they did before. When the mind is suffering less, it's stronger. It's in a better position. So as we meditate, we're trying to develop these inner qualities that we can rely on. These inner sources of strength, this inner food, starting with the breath. In the beginning, it may not seem like much, but as you really get into it, you realize that it permeates the entirety of your body. And the quality of the breath is really going to have to have an impact on the quality of your experience of everything else. The quality of your mindfulness, the quality of your alertness, has to have an impact on every, everything else. So work on these things. Once you're skilled in mindfulness and alertness, it changes the way you relate to everything else.